So I don't want to claim that this is the most important machine learning video that you will watch in your entire life. But I do genuinely think that the content that I will cover in this video, the things we will talk about, is actually some of the most important stuff in machine learning ever. In other words, I might not do the content justice, but you really, really need to get what uh, we are going to talk about here. And this is because we're trying to answer the question, what model should I use in the end? Um, in linear regression, I need to make a whole bunch of decisions. I need to figure out um, how many uh, the order of the polynomial that I'm going to use or how many radial basis functions. In neural networks, I might need to decide on the number of hidden layers and the number of units. When I'm going to regularize, I need to decide how much am I going to regularize, what's the value of the regularization parameter. In any model, I typically need to decide how long am I going to train. Um, we need a systematic way of figuring out how to make these decisions. And then we also need a way to figure out what performance we can actually expect. After I've decided all of those things, how can I get a way in which I can say, okay, I'm going to give this model to a client or maybe to a professor, and I need to tell them that this is the performance that they can expect from this model. How do we do that? That's what we'll talk about in this video. So how do we know which model to pick? So for example, for linear regression, we need to choose the degree of the polynomial features. Um, we need to figure out the number of radial basis functions. If we're going to use RBFs, should we use polynomial features rather than RBFs? Should we use both? How do we set the value of the regularization parameter uh, lambda? Should we use L1 or L2 regularization? How do we figure out what is the best model to use given a particular data set? One option, would be to look at the value of the loss, or maybe the mean square error or the root mean square error in the case of regression um, on the training data. So we, we, we've we trained a model and we've got this, um, you know, J loss, and we can look at that loss for our training data. In the case of classification, we could maybe look at the accuracy on our training data. But the problem with this approach is that the more complex or expressive a model is, for example, a higher order polynomial or lower values of the regularization parameter will always give us a better number on the training data. So here's the idea. What we're going to do is we're going to hold out a validation set, which we don't train on. And then we're going to look at different model options on that validation set. In other words, if this is the whole data set that we have here, so this is the first item in our data set. So this is the first input, first output, second input, second output, nth input, nth output. And these things can will probably be uh, feature vectors. Um, if that's our entire data set, then what we're going to do is we're going to split off 20% of that data set. We're going to call that the validation set. And we're going to keep the other 80% as our training data. And then what we're going to do is we're going to fit our model on this part, on the 80% of the training data. And we're going to evaluate on the 20% test data. On the slide here, I've ordered them. So it looks like you take the first 80% as the training data and the last 20% as the validation data. That's... Um, Probably not a good idea, but it depends a little bit on the specific setting that you're working in. You would want this validation data to be close to how you're going to use it in practice, um, your system. Um, so a better idea might probably be to shuffle your data and use a random 20% as validation and a random 80% as training. But that might also not be a good idea. Again, it depends on your on your specific training setting. For example, when you're doing speech recognition, uh, you're probably going to use your speech recognition system on speakers never seen during training. So in that case, you would want your validation set to contain a different set of speakers than the set that you're training on to emulate the real use case as close as possible. Okay, but the idea is basically you split your data, your complete data set into a training set and a validation set and you fit the model parameters on this part and you test 
um, you calculate your metrics or you calculate your loss on the validation data. And in, and in that case, now you can start to make um, better um, conclusions about which model is better. Okay, so for example, you can set your regularization parameter by trying a few different lambdas. You train a model with one lambda, you evaluate it on your validation set, you try a different lambda, you evaluate it on your validation set, and then you pick the best lambda. Now the question is, you're going to, you, you've built your model, and now you want to tell your client or your professor, listen, if you're now going to run this model, uh, in the wild on real data, then you can expect this performance. You can expect this accuracy or you can expect this mean squared error if you're doing regression. Now the problem is if you're going to give them that number based on what you found on the validation set, you're probably going to be a little bit optimistic because remember what you actually did was you tried a bunch of different lambdas on the validation set. So the validation set number is probably a little bit optimistic and your professor or your client will be a little bit angry if they then actually run this stuff and see that they're not getting the performance that you told them that um, they would get. So the question from your client to your professor is going to be, how well does this model generalize to data that I've never seen before, neither during training, but also not during the process in which I picked the, um, for example, the regularization parameter or the process in which I picked the order of the polynomial that I will use. So here's the idea, and this is really the, the final idea, and it's, it's kind of the standard way in which we do machine learning. What we're going to do is we, again, have our whole data set, all the data that we have available in this setting. And what we're going to do is we're going to use 80% of the data for training, and we're going to use 10% for validation and then we're going to use 10% for testing. Now the test set is like a little bit holy. The idea is that you never touch this test set um, while you're developing your model. You don't figure out how to set lambda, you don't figure out the number of RBFs that you want to use, you don't figure out whether you're using um, k-nearest neighbors classification or naive base classification or um, a neural network all of those decisions you make on the validation data. So if you're going to try a particular model, you train on this set, you validate on that set, you calculate your metric. You do that again, different model, train, validate, note the metric. And then in the end, you pick the best model, given some reasonable assumptions. And then what you do after you've um, picked your final model and you're like super convinced that this is the best model that you can get, then you calculate the performance on the test data, and, and then that's the number that you give to the client or the professor, and you tell them, this is the performance you can expect from this model that I'm giving you. And that's kind of the most honest thing that you can do, because you've never um, run anything on the test data. You've never looked at the test data. And it's very important in machine learning to, to follow this process, because otherwise you're just going to be essentially dishonest, but also, um, genuinely optimistic in um, the performance that you report. So this idea of using a validation set to basically see how I should pick my model is quite powerful. It's a very simple idea, right? But it is a powerful idea. And the one nice thing that it allows you to do is to um, figure out whether your model is overfitting or underfitting. So here on this slide, I've got a kind of rough plot. On this axis, I've got some indication, and this is a cartoon, um, but I've got some indication of how complex my model is. Maybe on this side, I've got a very, very high order polynomial. On this side, I've got a very low order polynomial. Or if we think about regularization, on this side, I'm not regularizing at all. So I've got one over lambda is um, very large. Um, or I'm uh, regularizing a lot, so lambda is really big, so I've got a very, very small one over lambda. So this axis is a degree of complexity. And on this axis, I've got the error. This can be your loss or your mean squared error. And what we would expect is, let's first look at this um, training curve, the green curve here, is that the more complex our model is, the lower the error will be. 
And this makes sense. We've seen this in the previous videos as well. If I have a very high order polynomial or I'm using a ton of radial basis functions, my error is going to get smaller and smaller and smaller as I'm using a more complex model. Now let's look at this curve, which is the validation loss. If our model is too simple, if we're on this side of the plot, then we're going to have a high error on our validation data because the model that you're using, the order of the model, the complexity, is just too simple to fit the data well, and the model doesn't generalize. As we increase the complexity, for example, we use a higher order polynomial, the performance on the validation will start to improve. So we will get a lower error, the error will go down. But then at some point, we're going to make the model so complex that it starts to fit the training data really well, but it doesn't generalize anymore. It will get worse and worse on the validation data. And the cool thing about this plot is how do you decide your final model? You choose the one with the lowest validation loss. A little bit more technically, um, this setting here where our model is too complex, that's called overfitting. That's when you fit the training data really well, but the model doesn't generalize. The other extreme is that your model is too simple and then we get underfitting. So the model just doesn't capture what's happening in the data. You will sometimes see that people refer to this setting as the high variance setting. So there's high variance. I won't go into the details of exactly why that is, but just so that you know. And this setting is high bias. So high bias, underfitting, high variance is overfitting. I should also add here that when we're reporting the training loss, as in these types of plots, then we don't include uh, the regularization penalty term so that the value that you get on this axis is comparable between the training and the validation um, number. On the validation data, you would actually never include the regularization term because the regularization term is really there to limit the model, um, to basically make it less complex so that it fits the validation data better, or more specifically, so that it generalizes better. Okay, so I've rambled a bit through the theory um, with my handwritten notes. Let's see how this applies when we have to make a decision on what model to use on an actual data set. Now, this is, of course, a toy data set, but it's still some real data. So let's see how this process goes. Our first step is to split our data. So we've got this um, data set, but we're going to split it into training, validation and test sets. In this example, I will only um, split off a validation set and I probably pick a set that contains a few more points than I would typically use. So in the previous slides, I spoke about an AT1010 split, which is quite typical. Here I'm using a few more validation points just to make the point. I'm also not splitting off a test set um, because just for this example, we'll just focus on the difference between the training and the validation data. But in a real setting, you will split off a test set which you won't look at while figuring out which model to use. You will only look at that test set right at the end. Okay, so the orange points here, this point, this point, this point, for example, is our validation point, and the blue points here, that's our training data. So this is what our training data looks like on its own. I've removed the validation data. And what we're going to do now is we're actually going to fit some models to this training data. The first thing I fit is a 15th order polynomial. It gives me a pretty good mean squared error on the training data. And you can probably already guess why that is, right? This is a quite powerful model. Some of the points are hit almost exactly. So we're getting a very, very small error on our training set. Next, I fit a first order polynomial or, you know, just a simple linear regression model, a straight line. In this case, the mean squared error is much higher than what we got with the 15th order model on this training set. Here's a third order polynomial. Here, the mean squared error on the training data is much better than the first order model, but it's actually worse than the 15th order model. The 15th order model gave us a, a mean squared error of 0 0.0243. So on the training data, this is actually a worse model than our 15th order model. This is what our 15th order model looked like. And just based on the mean squared error on the training data, I would actually have to pick this model. 
That's despite the fact that I'm probably intuitively inclined to definitely prefer this model, but the mean squared error here is higher. So this just highlights the problem of just looking at your training data. Let's repeat this process, but see what happens on the validation data. So here's our 15th order model. This is the low training mean squared error that we got, but look at the humongous validation mean squared error that we're getting. This model is definitely overfitting. We're getting a very, very small training uh, mistake, but a huge validation mistake. This is the first order model that we looked at. Um, and we can see here that the validation loss here, compared to the best scores that we've seen, is actually still pretty high. We've seen numbers like 0.06 and 0.02, so this is actually still pretty high. You can also see that it's quite high on the training data still. So this is an underfitting situation. Both our training and our validation scores are um, high, our errors are high, and that means that we're underfitting or um, slightly more technically we're in a high bias setting. This is the result from the third order uh, polynomial. And here we see that we get actually the lowest validation loss of these three models, 0 0.1. And it's roughly in the same order as our training loss. So this is where we're getting it um, just right. Just as one additional example to show you the power of regularization. This is again a 15th, 15th order polynomial. But here we've regularized with a regularization parameter of 0 0.01. We've used lasso L1. And here we can see that we're still getting a pretty good validation loss. So this could have been an alternative model that I could have um, chosen. And I probably would have had to tune the regularization parameter on my validation data. I end off with this slide with big words in bold because it's so important. Training on your test data is one of the worst mistakes you can make in machine learning. You will get a number which is almost meaningless and you give it to someone else. They're relying on you and your model and you've basically uh, in a way lied to them. So please make sure that you don't train on your test data. Unfortunately, this is something that happens way easier than you might think. So just when you're loading in your data, you might shuffle it and then split off the 80% and the 10, 10%. And in that process, you can quite easily m mess up things. One of my previous supervisors normally said, you know, take the test data and, you know, put it in a different directory. Don't even load it when you're loading your data on which you're going to develop um, the model. And I think I, I subscribe to that idea and I would encourage you to be the same. The important thing is to be careful with your test data and really treat it as a completely different um, different set. I hope that answers some of the questions that have been coming up through a whole bunch of the previous videos on how do we actually um, systematically decide whether model A or model B is better on this data set.